going to kick this off and get the show on the road, as they might say. Uh, so everyone, this is the Modular Clubhouse, and in tonight's, or today's, or this morning's, or this afternoon's episode, uh, we have two very special guests. Uh, hailing from Noise Engineering, we have Marcus and Patrick. Um, first off, thanks so much for joining, and I, I appreciate you making time in your uh, busy schedule to join me for this this very special episode. I think this is the actual second time where I have two guests at the same time, um, but also two guests who are connected through different devices. Um, so again, a new uh, experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> Happy how have you here. been? How, how have you? Yeah. How have you been? Well, you know, it's uh, it's been one of those years, but we're moving along. We've uh, just released some plugins today, so that's very exciting. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that the um, uh, the f the freebie. What were they called again? I did a um, I did a video on the very first iteration, and I was impressed. And today's update introduced LFOs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it introduced mm -hmm. a whole lot of modulation options, um, as well as some new MIDI features and just some general workflow improvements. Awesome. And uh, what are you are you involved in any way, shape, or form with the uh, module uh, development uh, at all, or uh, how, what are your roles there? So I uh, was brought on originally as a tester, so I would basically do anything that wasn't engineering. Um, you know, when a module's released, I'll have played with it for hours and hours, just making sure it does everything we want it to. Um, mm -hmm. I also do uh, panel art and that sort of thing, and I write internal and uh, customer-facing documentation. Um, so I do a bit with the uh, the hardware. Awesome. Um, yeah, Patrick, but for yeah. me, um, yeah, I mean, I've kind of been with the company for about four years, off and on. Um, but I was officially into the company last year, but I've been doing the, the demos, like a lot of the the official demos for the modules. Going all the way back to Clep Diaz, I've been putting those together and that's been my main focus for, for the mm -hmm. first three years of that. Then um, I came on board full time last September and you know I'm, I'm doing full marketing at this point with uh, social media, with a lot of other campaigns behind the scenes, a lot of video production, of course, a lot of module um, patches and things that you see on all the accounts and just <laughs> trying to show people how to how to how to how to use the modules and use all of the gear which has been really exciting for me and I do some testing too but I'm really more focused on the promotional side and less on the engineering side but you know I uh, I'm learning tons as I'm going through it so I'm sure I'll be adding more as time goes on which I'm really really excited about awesome so between the two of you uh, we have the the core of the well, you might say the the, the 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 testing and the user experience and the the initial feedback uh, that will go back into engineering. I'm assuming. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of thinking of it. Mm -hmm. Superb, superb. So that that, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And um, one of the things I always want to understand is a bit more about. Um, where people came from musically, and I uh, already read on uh, on the bios, Marcus, that you had a very early start with music uh, and music instruments. Uh, and I was wondering, Patrick, if you had something similar. Yeah, I mean, I my background has been I was classically trained in piano and trumpet and played those for many years mm -hmm. in schools, and um, I was actually getting a a uh, like a music education degree when I started but then I took the media route halfway through my college career and then I was in broadcast for quite a bit radio mm -hmm. and television but I still stayed focused on music um, you know as an audio engineer some of that and, and some time of that in between and so um, you know the love for modular just really picked up in the mid 2000 uh, 20 2010, 2014, I'll just say specifically. And um, so that, that kind of brought me back into really starting to fall in love with, with music again and just getting that tactile feel with instruments. And, um, you know, and I, I was kind of also, I feel fortunate that I was on Instagram at a time when they were really growing organically with like videos and 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was really focused on trying to put the videos out all that I could, doing patches every night and just growing the community on social at that time. And so that really helped me as well. And then it just every day, I just, it just became a part of my life. And so that's um, so I'm, it, I'm really excited to be in this position now because my original degrees were audio production and marketing. And now I'm doing audio production <laughs> and marketing. I'm, I'm actually doing the degree that that I was uh, signed up for, you know, a mm -hmm. long time ago. So that that feels pretty good, you know, to be to be back in the place that I originally in, intended to be when I thought about my career when I was young. And you typically don't hear it that often in, in, in your Iraq that people actually end up what they studied for, to be honest. Yeah, and I mean, it's nice to have a lot, but I do bring a lot of experience between making that decision in college and now. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, just being in the broadcast world, I've learned tons about content and writing content and sharing and social media posts and working with algorithms and understanding what audiences like and what they don't like and how they consume content. And so taking all these ideas and putting them into um, to this part of the music industry is just fascinating. I just really enjoy, um, you know, just being able to take some <laughs> ideas I've learned on a large, on a broadcast scale, yeah, and applying them to this to this business. And I feel like there's a lot of parallels, no matter what industry that you're in. But I feel fortunate to have a lot of experience to bring to this company to try to, um, you know, just to try to make great products and help people as much as we can and create communities I, I think it's all you know I don't think there was any time wasted in my in my <laughs> career whether I was doing music or not awesome awesome and then well I, I might need to pick your brain at, a, at another date uh, on, on audio production and maybe even how the algorithms work so um, because I, I do need to make sure that the uh, my channel is still growing and well, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably not something we, we do tend to go into tangents on this show. So we've had philosophy discussions, we've had culinary <laughs> discussions, um, we had history discussions uh, with, uh, uh, with 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 uh, Ross from Muffinzeif, and um, yeah, maybe maybe we need to do a uh, a segue into the YouTube algorithm. Um, um, for you, for you, Marcus, I, uh, I I did read about what what you started with 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 violin and and piano. Um, is that something that still helps out uh, in today's point where you are in your life? Oh, definitely. I mean, so so I started uh, kind of similar to Patrick when I was mm -hmm. uh, you know a child. I was learning piano and violin, um, and uh, for most of my young life, I was mostly in the classical music world. Um, you know, playing in ensembles and, and small groups. I was in a string quartet for a little while. Awesome. Um, and th that sort of thing, um, you know, it helps you out musically because it's a very uh, coordinated and, and carefully planned out type of performance um, and, and way of making music. Um, so there's, you know, th that's kind of something that's helpful for no matter what you're doing in audio. Um, but it also helps with just communication and uh, working in a team uh, because it's you know it's something you're used to doing um, but I, I also think that you know having a, a classical music background helps you really with any type of music I, I started getting into electronic music when I was probably about 14 um, and that's when I started wanting to learn about production and everything kind of just calls back to the basic skills that I learned in piano class when I was a kid awesome and while the both of you were growing up, what kind of music was playing at home? Uh, did any of your, your parents have a distinctive influence on where you went musically? Well, for me, my parents did not, but my brother's <laughs> incessant playing heavy drums with Iron Maiden, uh, that, did, that did it for me. You know, I would come home <laughs> off the bus and I just hear like just insane, either a dream theater, Iron Maiden, and it just kind of kept me pumped up. I could come off the bus and like, man, this is great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he's actually been a big influence because he, he was the first one that showed me a synthesizer 
the Korg MS-10, and he did like this filter sweep with an old Frankenstein uh, Edgar Winter Group song from the 70s. And he, he just showed me what a filter sweep was when I was like 13. I'm like, this is insane. I'm in. <laughs> 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 and uh, ever since then, I've been chasing that dream. You know, just like I just want a really good filter sweep for my for my tracks. Um, so really, it was my brother who who got me involved. I mean, my parents, of course, they paid for the the lessons and they gave me that opportunity to do a lot of piano lessons. And I did trumpet lessons for a while too, but. Mm-hmm. Um, it really wasn't until that filter sweep thing happened where I really started putting everything together and trying to find my own path. Awesome. And is is is, is that? And this is always a bit of a um, <laughs> egocentrical question, but is is metal still a a part of your life by now? <laughs> uh, the panel, uh, yeah. There's metal in the modules. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not that kind of metal. Apologies. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's interesting. Like when I first started playing modular, I was really melodic and um, not sing songy, but I was just always loved doing melodies with everything. And then, lo and behold, noise engineering came into my life, and I started understanding, you know, the the modules and and then and they're more aggressive and more to me i feel like they're more of a metallic sounding more aggressive you know just the, mm-hmm. the way that the sounds are and i and i remember telling chris you know with steven and chris i i, I remember telling her a, cu- a couple of years ago i was at her house i'm like you know what it's amazing how much my sound has changed since i started doing demos for you i'm a lot more aggressive and more you know more thick and metallic sounding and she's like you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> So I, I do that. like it, you know, and, and it's the more that I, I study the way sound works that I really do enjoy that sound. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, I would say that it's becoming, it's coming back into my life as being an influence just in a different way. Oh, awesome. But still listening to uh, Iron Maiden and Dream Theater then, or? Yeah, I, I was on a vinyl kick um, a couple of years ago and I bought all the albums that influenced me as a kid and I've got, <laughs> I've got to, uh, a couple Iron Maiden albums in there just so I can go back and reminisce. Awesome. And well, one of my theories is there are two kind of people in the modular sphere. And it is, on the one hand, people that really were into metal but still are but don't really want to admit it. Um, and people who haven't touched upon metal because they they were never exposed to it uh, during their childhood what, what was that like for you uh marcus any any hidden metal backgrounds for you i definitely had a, a bit of a uh, metal kick when i was probably in high school um with some of the like 2010s hardcore influences probably more than anything um mm-hmm. but uh yeah metals it's an interesting genre too because uh I mean, getting technical for a second, some of the recording techniques and just ways that guitars are layered and that sort of thing um, mm-hmm, yeah. is uh, it's very interesting. Um, and it really applies to a lot of different stuff, you know, whether you're using a guitar or a synthesizer. Um, just the, the way that tracks are mixed and arranged is uh, there's a lot to learn from it. So, yeah, I, I don't listen to metal too often these days, but it's definitely, I enjoy it. <laughs> that's great no uh, as i said uh, this is a very ecotestical uh, point for me because i i'm still a big metal head and i try to incorporate as much of my metal upbringing into my modular as well but i i do seem to make really upbeat very <laughs> almost danceable music and I'm not I'm, I'm still trying to understand why that is um <laughs> but maybe yeah that that's that's a bit of my journey um so in regards to noise engineering um I do have to ask Marcus where the development cycle is on the speedboat Eteritas <laughs> <laughs> you know that one's uh, it's still it's not holding water yet yeah. we're, we're still working on that <laughs> <laughs> no, this is um for for those of you listening, this is on um Marcus's uh, um, uh, what, uh the bio page on 
noise engineering. So if you look that up, the Desert Island module, um, Marcus, um, tongue in cheek answered, Speedboat Iteritas. So yeah, <coughs> so I was just I was just wondering there. Um, but for both of you, what is, in your humble opinion, and I think that the both of you are probably the best, um, well, the best people to make this judgment, is the absolute best or the most interesting noise engineering module out there? And for me, um, I really enjoyed uh, the progression of the, the Versio platform. Um, everything that we've been able to put out on there has been really exciting. Um, even just starting with the uh, just Modus Versio, I, I've been wanting us to do a reverb for years and mm -hmm. uh, seeing that whole development cycle and the different iterations that it went through and just the uh, pretty intense development near the end that we had to do revision after revision just to get it exactly where we wanted it to be. Um, it was really exciting when it finally came out. And I think that it's one of those things that's uh, it's very unique. There's nothing else that's really like it. And with mm -hmm. the possibilities of the alternate firmware to turn it into yeah. you know, kind of a, a huge number of things now, um, I think it's a really powerful module. And uh, given its size, it really fits nicely into pretty much any system. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I also think that the... The overall Versio platform, um, by which I mean the, the collection of modules and the collection of firmwares that are currently available, um, does fit a a bit of white space in the in the in the Eurorack uh, sphere. So, what you have on the one hand is the very well the the analog uh, approaches. You've got the uh, the di the digital well custom or very well specific um, uh, function modules and on the other hand of the spectrum you've got programmable units like for instance the the, the Bifaco Lich um, or, but also the oh, now I forgot what the the other one is um, those kind of modules that are built around the the TNC platform or anything else and I think that the the Versio is right there smack in the middle. Uh, because it is, on the one hand, it is a programmable unit, and you'll you'll never know what else is going to come out in the in the coming uh, in the coming years. Uh, but you don't need to go as far as to learn how to reprogram or program uh, the uh, the module itself. Um, was that a very well? Was that a a very, a very obvious choice for noise engineer to do it like that, or was that more of a um, an organic decision that came to be yeah I mean it's kind of both really the uh, the Versio fills a nice niche for us because we have a lot of module ideas you know when, when we design stuff um, all six of us input on the design process um, and when we had our uh, uh, annual meeting a couple months ago we had it was something like 140 module concepts that we had to talk about and Ooh. prioritize and think through and um, wow, having a platform like the Versio, where you know we can come up with something, and Stephen can program a uh, a firmware for us in a matter of days sometimes, um, is really cool. And it just helps with uh, you know seeing what works, what doesn't, um, and and getting more interesting products out on the market. Um, and as you say, it's it's a nice middle ground because I'm by no means an engineer at all, uh, but mm -hmm. it's a great module in my system. I use it couple of them in almost every patch um, mm -hmm. but it's also been really cool to see what uh, people in the community have done to make custom firmers and that sort of thing so it's uh it's really got something for everybody perfect and but are you um involved in any of the well the, the code reviews or um or any of the the the, the actual programming because you say you, you're not a programmer but you, you probably have picked up some things here or there no, so I stay away from the uh, engineering side of things almost entirely. Um, I really, my job tends to be uh, in module development. Chris and Steven will give me something. I'll put it in my system and just kind of run it through its paces as best as I can. Um, <laughs> and I'll write all the things that are, you know, if it's an early prototype, all the issues that we have and things we might want to change and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes back to them for further development. But uh, no, I'm, I'm not an engineer at all no, that's no. that's above me no no worries um and 
in testing the um, uh, the software that was also the, the plugins that were released today, is that is that something that you will look into or? Yeah, so the software testing is uh, internally done by me and Alana. Uh, she tends to head up the software test at this point. Um, okay. But yeah, that's been quite a long process, and the last uh, couple of months for me have been primarily focused on uh, software testing and, and just making sure that they work well in, in a whole variety of different configurations and systems and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, we have about, I think about eight different computers that we uh, have set up in various ways so that we can try out different operating systems and that sort of thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I use about six DAWs in my day-to-day -day oh, just wow. to make sure that <laughs> things are uh, working how we want them to. So. And I find yeah, Ab Ableton uh, challenging enough at times, just one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. And and Patrick, for you, the your personal favorite module, any module, what what would you what would you say? Ooh, well, I I have to say Memetic Digitalis. It's always been my my favorite, and there's a lot of history between me and the MD. I'll call it because. When I first started doing demos for the company, I was easing my way into it with some utilities and some, you know, different oscillators. And then all of a sudden, I get this this um, new module called Memetic Digitalis, which is a 16-step sequencer and all these nice parameters. We use CV, <laughs> yeah. and I'm just like, oh my gosh! Like I, this is what I've been trained for, right? I've got to figure out how to really make this thing work. And it's the longest video I put out and it has the most in-depth explanation of how everything works. And of course, you, when, when you put it on camera for other people to figure it out, I have to learn this module 100%. And it was so jam-packed with so many features, I just feel like there's a connection to that module because I learned so much so fast. And then having to, to teach it to everyone else through a demo. So since then, because it came out of I think in 2018 or 20, uh, late 2018, somewhere around there. But since then, I found so many more uses for it. I mean, even Marcus and I were talking um, a couple days ago how we can use the Mimetic Digitalis to to set up like random triggers for drum patterns, and we can use it as a it's like as a random trigger. We can use it to um, to 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 amplify patterns with the VCA, like there's so many different things that it can do other than just 16 step sequencing. And, um, you know, you put it with the switcher and now you have 64 steps, like there's all these new things that I'm just learning every day on how to, how to use it. So mm -hmm. it's become such a part of my, of my system because it has so much functionality in that small space. Yeah. I, uh, I can't, I can't not patch with it because there's always something new that's happening with it. Um, no matter what I do with it, so for for that I really, I just really feel good about it. So it's a, it, it it does already feel a bit like your module, you might say. Mm hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like I was one of the first that that had a hand on it, and then we put the demo on. It's like I'm never going to get rid of this. I I feel really good about it, and I, when I see people with that hashtag or just people posting with it. I mm -hmm. just uh, there's this ongoing satisfaction for years afterwards, just knowing that um, that I just like it's like we we, we put it out in, into the world and it's really just taken off in such a a fun way. And I just love that people still get a lot of value for it and they're learning new things. And I'm still learning from other people on how they they patch mm -hmm. with it in ways that I just never thought myself. So it's it's just a constant learning tool. Yeah, I think that that's mm -hmm. one thing that's of course true for for a lot of the um, the modulation modules out there, where uh, they can be applied in in all different ways, shapes, or forms. Um, where you say, okay, well, well, your creativity is the only thing holding you back from thinking of something new, or and then you you see someone else doing doing X, and you can then evolve that into Y, and that is of course. That is that. That's a great approach, and I think that that's also the the allure and the the charm and the romance within within Eurorack. I, I, I might say, awesome. And then maybe a bit of a of another question. Um, 
do either of you have any any modules that you simply haven't been able to jive with, uh, whether they are from noise engineering or from other manufacturers? Um, I'm always interested to to understand what people's uh, styles are coming to that. It's a funny question, and uh, I both Patrick and I have pretty large systems. I've probably turned over um, more modules than Patrick has, just because you know interests change and and that sort of thing. But uh, recently, I've been finding that you know if there's a module that I sold a year ago, I'll think about it again and be like, oh man, I kind of wish I hadn't sold that. Oh um, yeah. So at at uh, at this point, when the system is is growing more than it's shrinking, and uh, there's a lot of great modules out there, and uh, the the more you learn about modular, kind of playing into Patrick's point here, the the more you can do with you know even a, a simple utility or something like that. So I'm finding more and more that there's a, a pretty good use for almost anything. Absolutely. Patrick? Yeah, I'd say for me, um, you know, I'm not really. I, I've realized I'm not really a sampler guy. And I want that to change because I know there's so much, it just opens up an entire new level with so many people. And I've talked to so many friends who've got so many really cool samplers and just being able to bring in sounds from outside of your system. Mm-hmm. I, I'm really locked in lately to just performing in a small case with no sampling. There's just something about being in that space, whether it's 48 HP or 60 HP or, you know, one of those 4MS like pods that they have out yeah. and just really maximizing, trying to do a 10 minute patch with five modules, you know, and making, making it sound interesting is where I'm at. But the moment I put a sampler in there, I feel like it takes away a little bit from this sense of really navigating the modules and doing what they can do by themselves. But I do want that to change. Like I have... I have the ER301. I've had it for like two years, and most of the time it just sits there. I don't. It's such a learning curve, but I want to figure it out. I, I just feel like I need to know as a modular player how this mm-hmm. thing works, and so I'm setting time aside every week just to spend at least 30 minutes or one hour with it and just really understand how it is before I make any decisions about whether to put it in my patch or let it sit mm-hmm. there and collect dust. It's such a great module, and I just I want to be able to get into that. I want to be able to change my mind a little bit with sampling, and so this mm-hmm. might be the year where I start incorporating more of that. But I've really just. But then the I, three such, the three hundred one is probably like well, it's it's like the the godfather of of samplers, you might say. Yeah, yeah, but I, I enjoyed the small cases and doing everything with all the sounds within that case so much right now mm-hmm. that I'm in no rush to do it. But at, at some point I really want to understand sampling better and just, I, I feel like I'm missing out a little bit when I hear so many great tracks with people using samples and that's probably my weakest link right now. And have you, have you played with, uh, with smaller, um, more straightforward samplers as well, or have you only worked with the 301? Yeah, I have the Morphogene that I play every now and then, and the Nebulae from Cubit Electronics. Yeah, um, you know those those are probably my uh, my other two. I'd love to get into um, even like I have like the two HP Play, which just plays you know oh, samples. Yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah. of minimal, but um, I think the next probably in between the three hundred one and a two HP Play is the Morphogene. So that's probably where I'm going to want to spend a lot of my organic patching with and maybe not as much studying like I would with 301 but I would really try to see how I can play with it on the fly yeah, and I morphogene. think the morphogene will give me that satisfaction where you, you're you more feeling your way into it uh, as opposed to um, having the let's almost call it methodical approach that you will need to use the 301 yeah mm-hmm. awesome 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 no, that's great. And then, and I'm I'm just want to be absolutely cautious of the of the time that we have here. Um, I always want to make sure that I understand the the people a bit better before we leave. If 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 you were to go back to a to a point back in time when you might have been 
doubting yourself, you're doubting your career in, in, in music, um, what would be the number one advice you would give your previous self? Oh, that's an interesting question. So it's funny because I uh, coming into modular was uh, really in a lot of ways kind of a bad idea for me because you know I, I had just gotten out of uh, high school actually when I first started getting into Eurorack and uh, basically like every spare penny I had was just going into building up a system and mm -hmm. uh, even at the time I was like man I'm, I'm spending so much money on on this stuff like is this really gonna go anywhere for me and then you know I, I started getting more into the music technology side of things and I met Chris and Steven and you know here we are uh, four or five years later <laughs> so it really worked out, but um, just that kind of, you know, go through gut, go with the things that are interesting and kind of stick to the things that really feel correct and, and the right way to go, even if they're a little off the path. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that I did that, and I think that's something that uh, we don't emphasize enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for you personally, what is the absolute best thing about ending up where you are currently? What are you most grateful for? Oh man, that's, yeah, it's, I love working here because, you know, we're a pretty small team, um, so we all know each other really well, um, and it's just a really fun company to work at. Um, you know, we, we have a, a book club, um, we, we have a, uh, an annual retreat where even though we're remote, we still get to meet up every year, eat a bunch of great food, hang out, um, awesome. and, uh, you know, there's just a good emphasis on, you know, you you work really hard, but we have some very strong boundaries around like work life balance. Um, so I know that even on a really busy week, I'll still have time at the end of the day to make a nice dinner, do some patches myself and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just, I think I really enjoy my job. I really, uh, love everybody that's on the noise engineering team. And I'm really happy to have kind of ended up in, in this sort of role. I'm never bored. <laughs> awesome and and just a, a, a quick follow-up question and then i'm gonna pass the same question over to uh, to patrick um you mentioned the the, the work-life balance um how has that changed uh, maybe for you personally but also within noise engineering more generally uh when work went remote did that deteriorate did that improve what was your take on that yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was an interesting change because, uh, I mean, first off, at the beginning, none of us really expected it to go on this long. Um, of course, yeah. But uh, the the reality was, like, I was already working partially from home. I'd only go in to work, you know, two or three days a week. Um, and then when uh, the the first lockdowns happened, uh, I was like, okay, I guess I guess we're going completely remote now. Um, and again, we thought it would be temporary, but then things kind of stayed as they were and the the awesome thing is it really opened up some opportunities because uh now we have members of the team all over the country like adam is in uh i think minnesota and then of course patrick's on the east coast um so it, it's really nice to be able to you know have that kind of geographic diversity within the company it really means we have the the best people uh that we can um and, yeah. you know, it means that for me personally, like, I don't have to commute anymore, so I save a lot of time. Um, I have my uh, my home system at, you know, within arm's reach whenever I'm working, so it makes testing easier. Um, I do miss, you know, seeing my coworkers a few times a week, but, you know, that's what the that's what our retreats are for, and we talk on Zoom a few times every week. So, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it was a change, but I think overall it definitely had some positives. Mm -hmm. And I I also read that um, um, you all use Slack pretty uh, extensively, also on the well, on the on a more serious note, but also for making sure to maintain that that camaraderie, uh, working with the rest of the team as well. Yeah, Slack is Slack is awesome. It's uh you know it's such a simple tool, but it's it's really fun and it just kind of even if you're just staring at a computer all day, it feels like there's some some people there that you can just chat with whenever you need to. It's a, it's a really great tool and the, the company Slack is a pretty fun and hilarious place to be. <laughs> that's great, that's great. Um, I do hope that you uh, one time will 
dedicate a book on that. What what kind of things uh, everyone is talking about on the noise engineering <laughs> Slack? I would. Um, I, I, one of my thoughts was when you when 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 either of you mentioned okay uh, during the retreat you were talking about 144 different modules. I I was thinking to myself I would love to have been a fly in the wall back uh, back in that retreat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then again, I'd love to be a, a a silent observer in the in in, in your Slack channels as well. Uh, <laughs> but Patrick, over to you. So if if you were to go back to that point in time where you might have said, "Well, okay, well, I'm investing in music. I'm investing in media," um, and you might have doubted yourself back then, uh, what would you tell that that younger Patrick? I would have told myself, start it sooner than I did and not sit on the opportunity to be creative. I, there was probably 10, you know, a decade that had gone by where I just kind of tinkered with things, but I was, quote, too busy with other things and I just let, let the opportunity slip past and I feel like now that I'm really found my passion for working with noise engineering and I find my passion with the modular sense communities that um, it's like, why couldn't I have gotten into this sooner? Like, why, why am I, I feel like it's a, I'm playing catch up, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to try to, um, to gain some lost time that I had from just from being away from music. And you know, it's such a therapeutic thing. Like modular really brought me into, I would have a stressful work. And when I was working in my former job, I would just come home and just music became therapy with the gear. And like, why didn't I just, Ah, I get, I get upset that I don't have albums that are not out in the year, you know, 2010. Instead, I had to wait till, you know, three or four years ago to put stuff out. And so I would say just take action, get on it, just start it. Don't worry about getting a plan. Just do, just get going and figure it out as you go. That would have been something <laughs> I would have told myself back then. So you would have given yourself a proverbial uh, kick in the, in the behind, you might say. Yes. Oh, yeah. always, always interesting to know that. Good to know, good to know. And, well, you already talked a bit about um, the, the, the the kind of family you found within noise engineering. Um, but what, what, are you, what are you most grateful for? Or what, what is something that really stands out uh, within that team? You know, I, one thing I really love about noise engineering is the focus on the community that, that is... Um, a part of the people who buy their products and who like to share patches mm -hmm. and hashtag the specific modules and you know just seeing the messages of, of people being so excited whether this was their first patch or their 500th patch with the BIA there's just there's a constant excitement <laughs> about the products and I it, the, the, the community is so positive you know it's really rare to find someone who's who's a jerk you know and I I, I appreciate that and I think that the community that I've built personally when I wasn't doing noise engineering work has carried on to now when I'm doing what I am doing now and it just feels like they're very supportive and they're, um, you know, I just, that that's something that I, I cherish and now that I feel like, now that I'm with this company, yeah, I can really help build that more and, you know, I do things on the personal side with the community here in Washington, D.C. and I also, um, like making those contributions. I feel like the type of content I put out on social media has value because people really do care about understanding how things work or how how to patch something differently and then there's a lot of response to that and so our you know our engagement just seems to always be outperforming which I really appreciate and it's very it just feels very natural for people to to reach out to us with questions and it it's a, it's just a really great position to be at. You know, we're not yeah. We're very transparent as a company, and you know we're not trying to to be Oz and put things behind a curtain. You know, it's uh, it's it's <laughs> nice. You know, it, it's just nice having having this uh, open communication with with everyone. So that I to me, I just have a a real love for that and for building that that type of um, friendships with everyone. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. Um. I've got two more questions, and then I'll uh, hand it over to the uh, well. Three, actually, three. One is one is a very straightforward question. Let's start with that. Um, 
and again, this is something that is uh, <laughs> quite important for me personally. Um, super booth, yes or no? Yeah, super booth is awesome. Um, Absolutely, yeah. We uh, participated in uh, their virtual one last year, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, whenever it's safe, I think we want to make it out there. Uh, I was actually scheduled to fly out in. Uh, 2020 and do a, uh, a booth there but um you know we all know how that went down oh yeah unfortunate that's quite unfortunate yeah no so this is um i'm, I'm still planning to attend this year this is going to be my my first super booth so uh hope to see uh hope to see uh, both of you there of course um then the um well the penultimate question you might say um <laughs> Where do you, where do either one of you see noise engineering evolve into in the coming years? Whether that's uh, years or decennia, or um, is there anything on its horizon where you might say, okay, well, this is something that we might be doing and if you are <laughs> and i don't want to break anyone's nda here of course so if there's anything that you can't d discuss don't feel pressure to do so uh but this is just uh, uh well thinking out loud you might say yeah um well so the sort of nearish future we have a lot of things that we want to do in software um awesome. you know, of course we just released that plugin update today um and we have quite a few things that are still uh, in the works there. We just released some uh, Reason plugins a couple months ago as well, yeah. uh, the, the rack extensions rather. Um, so yeah, you know, kind of moving from uh, just doing modular to also doing um, music software and that sort of thing um, is, uh, I think that's going to be important because it just makes, um, you know, our sound more accessible to more artists, no matter what platform they prefer. Mm -hmm. So what then, what makes a uh, noise engineering module or what makes noise, en noise engineering software truly be noise engineering? What is that defining quality in your expert opinions? You know, I think, yeah, I would, I just, I'd kind of follow up with what Marcus said too, and maybe this relates to this question, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the, the, the idea of being able to take a module, putting in a USB cable, clicking a couple buttons on a customer portal, and having an entirely different module, and it's something that the company, like us, you know, recommends. Mm -hmm. Being able to try before you buy in some aspects is, is new. I really like that idea. I mean, we've, we've heard of Easter egg firmware and yeah. our alt firmwares and these types of press, you know, this sequence of buttons and you get a completely different module. But, you know, I, I like this active, this proactive approach of just coming out with firmwares where you can just try before you buy and so you don't have to spend five hours in front of a demo unit in a store to necessarily, you know, you can actually put the module in your case, in your system, in your house and, yeah. and really play with it. And if it's, if you really are passionate about that change in the firmware, then you can get the hardware version of it and move on. You know, so having, a, you know, to me being fairly new and the with the company as far as uh, on a full time basis, I'm just really impressed with the idea of of swapping the firmware and just being able to have so many different options with one module. It just makes, to me, I feel like it's such an advanced step that I haven't seen in in a lot of other companies, and so I. I love that idea, and um, you know, it's a, it's a promise that we have is that we will always be writing more firmware as we go. You know, we yeah. just put out Lacrima Versio and the Melodis Versio, were two that we just put out late last year, and so um, you know, it's it's like just having that ability to change them out and, and test things. It's such a really good feeling to be behind a company that that's trying new things like that to make it really convenient for the community to try before you buy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we listen to the community and what they want. And like, like Marcus was saying, being able to, if you're not able to get to a store to, you know, to, to, to try a product, well, here it is in your home. You know, you don't have to drive, yeah. you know, for me in Washington, DC, we have one 
modular. We have one store that sells modular scent, and the next one's 250 miles away. Wow. So, you know, it's um, it's, it's so it's being able to to to, to do that from home with just a, a couple clicks is is awesome, and I think that that's I feel like that's very future thinking in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and just another thing that we spend a lot of time in the design process on is just workflow. Um, you know, like how is a module going to fit into a system? How is it going to be in a performance? And then we've taken that same philosophy uh, into our software as well. So, of course, all of our um, products, they have a, you know, you can tell when something's noise engineering just by the, the sound of it. Um, there's a couple of characteristics that we really like. Um, but really, the uh, ease of use and ease of performability are things that we've focused a lot on um, and that we spend a, a huge amount of time discussing when we're designing a piece of hardware, especially. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something that can, you know, really help set us apart, too. Um, you know, when something's in your case, you want it to be as quick to use and as straightforward to use as possible. Awesome. And, and and which of the the modules um, really embodies that approach? You might say. So if um, if someone is starting in your rack, and, and to be quite fair, I'm still quite new to to this whole world. Um, which would be the module you would then recommend to a starter to say, well, if you truly want to get modular in your hands and truly see it come to life. Which one would either of you recommend, or would it be the same one? That could even be, of course. Oh, that's a hard question, and I'm sure Patrick and I will have different answers. Um, but actually, I'll probably play into Patrick's favorite here and say that Mimetic Digitalis is a, uh, a really fun choice, <laughs> and I, I think it's one that can really grow with you as your case expands and as you get more used to modular. You know, I make plenty of patches with it where there's just you know a single clock going in, and then you can just record some CV patterns with the encoder, and it really brings a patch to life. Um, but, you know, I've also written a few blog posts about using it as, you know, more unusual things like a burst generator and a logic gate and uh, all yeah. those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's a, a great module that, you know, it's, it's a good in a starter case, and I still have it in my uh, 800 HP system. So. <laughs> wow. <I don't> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and, and I'll... Uh... I'll actually talk about an oscillator uh, just because for many years I helped noise engineering at NAM just do demos and I've you know gone places and done demos when a lot of us were having the get togethers at the synth stores and one thing I always watch when we do demos is just the response of people when they as soon as they touch something like as soon as they get their hand on that module and they turn that knob and just that feeling and just seeing that response it's really exciting, and I and I see a lot of people really excited about the Manus Ateritas because Ooh. it's an aggressive, it's a very aggressive oscillator, but you can also use it to create some really cool metallic ambient type of um, you know sounds that, that that are beautiful and reverb and you know it just it has its own envelope and just so many different. There's so many different characteristics of it that I, I feel like that one just gets the most love whenever I watch people play mm -hmm. with it in person. So, And it's one of those where you can just put it in and you start turning knobs and you instantly have this connection to it. There's just something about physically touching it and turning it that gives you this response that keeps begging you to play it more and more. So that, that one, I would say, is a, is a good oscillator to, to get started with. Awesome. And... It in regards to the most underrated module, what would that be? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, hmm. I've come out and said the Muta Jovis. <laughs> I, always, <laughs> I, always say, I always say the Muta Jovis is my favorite because it introduced me to switching and turning off and on tracks all the time. So I, I just love talking about the Muta Jovis, which is just a four-channel switcher, like, you know, mute switcher. Uh, I use it so much and it's I I wish that more people would use it because it just has this ability to create song flow within patches and um, so I'm just going to say that one I love I really enjoy it but I I wish there were more people <laughs> who could use it because there's something about it just yeah I I just I have a love for it 
<laughs> <laughs> that is a that that's an answer I didn't expect, but great. And for you, Marcus. Oh, I think I'll go with um, probably Fractio Solum. Um, I have two of them in my system, and they're really fun, especially with a, a CV sequencer, just for kind of sequencing on their own. Um, Patrick and I threw some patches back and forth a couple weeks ago, and we came up with some really cool stuff for uh, kind of polyrhythmic sequencing um, and doing uh, variable step length patches uh, with that and Mimetic Digitalis. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting kind of clock divider and multiplier, um, and it's small, so it'll kind of fit anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a it's a really interesting module and pretty unique too. Awesome, awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure to uh, read up on both of them. That's uh, that's gonna be my uh, recommended reading from the uh, Noise Engineering Book Club. Um, so then, my last question, and then I'm gonna open it up to the to the audience. Um, first off. Marcus, Patrick, I have to thank you so much for um, for joining, for your time, and also by sharing and, and, and opening up to, to me and the rest of the community here, of course, as well. And I want to return the, the favor and say, well, do you guys have any question for me that you want me to answer? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Ooh. So um, I am kind of obsessed with sequencers and I know you do a lot of uh, reviews on your YouTube channel. Has, has anything popped up recently that I should check out? Um, from a sequencing perspective, that is a great question. So I've been almost predominantly using the Hermit, uh, which is mm -hmm. of course quite an established name in sequencing. That has really, that's been my staple. Um, and other than that, I will in that same um, approach, and this is um, might be a bit odd for for some people. So the uh, the mandala by uh, by Nico from uh, Lycaon um, uh, synthesizers that has been. It's not a real sequencer. It's more like a, a, a gate sequencer or a trigger sequencer. But that is so extremely usable and tweakable that really blew my mind. And from a and it's not necessarily a sequencer, but it's more a uh, a phraser. That is the the phraser by by Super Synthesis. I think that once I got the the uh, the phraser in my rack, and I combined it with the uh, was it again the uh, two OPFM also by Super Synthesis. At that time, I it really came to life for me. It truly showed me. Okay, well this is. Okay, so this is how you can then, instead of just patching and programming and knowing exactly what to expect or what not to expect if you're doing something uh, generative, but this was very hands-on and ooh, I, I, I immediately fell in love with it. And uh, on a totally different note, I am looking into a, um, a first-time approach to the NerdSec. Um, I've, I've given that a try. I've given that a try, but I I do have to say I have no classical training. I've never worked with a tracker before, so I gave it a try, and it it didn't immediately work for me. But I am going to make sure that I'm going to make a video of that for for people that might not know trackers at all, and I'm just going to do that, and I'm going to plow through, and because it, it is it's such an amazing device, and I. I need to understand it, but the the learning curve is going to be a bit, well, a bit uh, bigger for me than for other people, maybe. Yeah, I've had the NerdSeek since launch. I love that module. It's oh, yeah. uh, it's definitely a bit to learn, but it's it's very, very. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities with it. It's a oh cool yeah, thing. and Thomas is such a great guy, and he's he's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. He's phenomenal, absolutely. Uh, but great question. Thank you so much for that, uh, Marcus. Appreciate that. Uh, and for you, uh, uh, Patrick, that, I would say my question for you is: since we were talking a lot about the Versio um, firmware, what would you like to see in a Versio module? Ooh, that is a great question. Well, you've got, you, you've already covered so much from an from an effects perspective in the Versio line <laughs> currently. So, what I would 
what I would actually like, and this is, and this this might be right up your alley as well, Patrick, is could you envision a a versio that is partially a sample player but also an oscillator? Hmm. And the reason for that is is because I think that with the control you have on the on the virtual mo- on the Versio module as a whole, it wouldn't make sense to just do an, an oscillator or just do a sample player. Uh, but if you then combine those two, uh, but maybe even use um, a sample as a as a wave shape and this is of course this is taking the whole granular approach to the next level which is of course already covered by uh, uh, which one is it again that's the the melotus um, but if you then take sampling and oscillation and then just see how that can then intertwine I think that that is that is a an area within modular or maybe even within synthesis that I'd love to will dive into and it's something that I'm trying to do with the with the setup I currently have but I haven't really gotten to a point where I say okay well now it becomes uh, something that I can truly play with it's still it's still experimental um, but I might I might get to a point where I'm like okay well now I <laughs> now I can make sure that I can truly perfect it to an art form but I, th- I do see that the the Versio platform would have the the capabilities it has the the playability and i think that it also has the well the horsepower to uh, to deliver on that mm-hmm. so that's my, that's my, my, my yeah i can i can envision what you're trying to achieve there so okay no that's perfect okay so that's a hunt so that's a hundred and forty one module idea. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta add that to the wall. <laughs> and then this is of course completely uh, provided free of choice. And as everything I do, I uh, I release everything on the Creative Commons uh, attribution. So go with it and uh, <laughs> go go forth and multiply. Sorry. Um, that being said, that's that that was a bit of an odd comment for me. Apologies for that. Um, perfect. Let's open it up to the audience. Uh, anyone in the live audience, please feel free to raise your hand if you want to join us on stage and ask any of us three um, whatever you want to uh, to ask, of course. And I will keep an eye on the companion channel to see if we have some questions there. Um, Adograph mentioned, I hear that in Tegra Funkitis is a hidden gem. Oh, oh yeah. Hot take. Yeah, Tegra Funkitis is a, a fantastic module. Um, I still have one in my system. Um, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it has a few interesting modes, and in it I use it a lot for uh, random gate sequencing these days. Um, but yeah, you know, if you just want to add some randomness to a patch, it's it's a lot of fun. Awesome. I'll look into that as well. And then we've got uh, Kyle from Signal Sounds. Um, he says, hi both, thanks for taking the time to chat to us. I have two questions. First question, can you tell us about your relationship with Electrosmith? I know the Versio range runs off the Daisy platform. That's the, that's the first question. Oh yeah, the folks at Electrosmith are awesome. Um, and the, the Daisy has been a, a, a wonderful tool for us to work with. Um, you know, the. Uh, uh, the Versio runs off that, so that's kind of in charge of doing the uh, things mm-hmm. with, you know, my favorites with Desmodus and Melotus and all that. So, um, yeah, we've been really lucky to be able to work with them. Awesome. That's great. And his uh, follow-up question is, for the Versio range, have you ever found the hardware to not exactly fit the opportunities that the particular firmware can offer, i.e. wishing that there was another pod or CV in for a parameter? Yeah, that happens on pretty much every firmware. Um, you know, but it's it's kind of one of those things where uh, having the constraints can kind of help you refine what an idea really needs to be. Um, mm-hmm. We ran into a lot of that on the uh, Melodis Versio when we were developing that. You know, there were a few different things that we wanted to try, and we kind of had to really commit to a certain direction and just stick with that. 
Um, but yeah, we're uh, that's always a, a struggle in hardware. You, you don't have the uh, unlimited space and unlimited parameters. Mm -hmm. Where well, you, well, you might say, okay, well, on the one hand, less is more, and the constraints will indeed um, force you to be more creative. Um, that's something I truly understand. But do you foresee a maybe even an expander module or companion module for the Versio platform? Well, we have we have plans for other things that we want to kind of think about in a, a similar. Mm -hmm. Vein. Somebody mentioned the uh, Daisy oscillator, which is the uh, Verde yeah. tear. Um, that's still we're still working on that, and we're trying to get that released as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll kind of be a, a similar idea, where it's another uh, platform. It's six HP. It has a pitch input, um, but um, you know, it's just a, a different style. So you know, there's 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 always room to grow, and there's. Mm -hmm. uh, a few other things that I can't talk about right now, but no, of course, um, of course, yeah. we're excited about uh, kind of expanding some possibilities on on other things. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, we might want to uh, discuss the the DC oscillator uh, later on. Um, then we've got a question from Maartje. Um I didn't hear the beginning of the interview, but how are you feeling about the success of the Basimulus? Are there plans to do more modules in that vein? Yeah, I mean, Basimilus is it's a wonderful module. We're so happy with how uh, the community has picked it up. You know, it, it's one of uh, our top sellers. Um, you, you hear it and, and see it in a lot of mm -hmm. cases and a lot of patches. Um, we t technically did kind of follow it up uh, with the Manus of Teratos. Um, Manus yeah. was based on kind of a similar structure to the Basimilus, but with a, uh, a different oscillator architecture. Uh, so, you know, more saws and more aggressive sounds. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic little voice, and uh, as is the Manus. Um, and mm -hmm. we're, we're really excited about how people have picked it up. Awesome, awesome. I've um, I've actually tried to stay away from, from any uh, BIA questions during the interview, but it's great to see that the... Uh, the audience <laughs> does want to discuss that, um, and of course, and I do have to uh, admit that uh, the the BIA, uh, but also the Manus and Territos, are still on my uh, on my wish list. So I'm still going to need to uh, save up uh, a buck or two for that. <laughs> um, uh, and and Marcia also added, I've learned through these interviews that some manufacturers are avoiding scaling up and issue uh, advertising and the like. Ha <laughs> ha. So that, that that is of course well, it, it, it is true for a uh, uh, for part of the the Eurek makers out there. But how would you f well how would you well categorize noise engineering in that regard? I mean, you know, we uh, we love seeing our instruments being used by anybody who's interested in them. Um, you know, we're we're not going to try to stay niche or anything like that, and the uh, the stuff we're doing with software where we have some free plugins right now with yeah. more stuff coming down the road. We really just want uh, anybody who's interested to get their hands on our, yeah. on our yeah. products. Yeah, because on the one hand, you might say that you are becoming a, a niche approach, uh, but a more cynical approach would be, well, you're creating unnecessary sc scarcity even. Yeah, I mean, modular in itself is... Uh, you know, it's, it's far less niche than it was 10 years ago, um, but mm -hmm. it's definitely still a, a smaller hobby within the, the world of synthesizers, but we're seeing more people uh, join the community uh, every day, and uh, mm -hmm. it's cool that, um, you know, it's just the community's growing, the community's expanding, and uh, we've, we've really found a, a place within that, which is absolutely. really fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you said, well, I think just offering the um the software that is of course opening up the the noise engineering sound to to people who would otherwise never um even consider diving into your rack uh, because as you say it's a niche within a niche within a niche already so yeah, yeah absolutely um then we've got question from 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 dan on well as you already uh, read the um the the daisy oscillator um 
Well, could you could you tell a bit more about the Daisy Oscillator? Because I, I I'm I'm unaware of that, so I'm I'm curious to learn. Oh yeah, so that's the uh, the Vertiter. Um, it's a uh, six HP stereo oscillator. Um, we announced it at NAM a few years back, and then we've just you know everything that's happened has uh, made it mm-hmm. difficult for uh, us to release it as we wanted to. Um, but you know, it's still in the works. Um, we have a lot of plans for it. I'm personally extremely excited about it. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, as as soon as we can, we're gonna uh, be be putting it out into the market. Awesome. Fingers crossed that that will of course change because, um, well, for my my assumption is that you have been impacted um, like everyone within well electronic manufacturing and maybe even more. Uh, given your um, well, the focus on the modules that you you make, uh, but uh, do you see that progressing? Do you see that improving in the in the short term, or is that still something that is gonna well, have an impact in twenty twenty two? Yeah, it's, it's always a challenge. Um, we've actually a lot of the uh, engineering time these past uh, couple of years has gone into uh, redesigning some of our products slightly just to uh, mm-hmm. make them easier to manufacture, more reliable, um, and with, you know, just make things as easy as we can um, for, for that sort of thing. Um, and we're really happy with the uh, improvements that we've been able to make. But of course, that takes away engineering time from new modules. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's always a, a balance there. Awesome. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Dan follows up with, uh, also, please come out with a more straightforward clocked Stereo delay for Versio, a la the Chrono Blob 2. Hmm, hot take there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, there's there's a lot of things to do within delay, um, and it's something that we've talked about quite a bit um, around here. I honestly use the uh, Melodis for uh, slightly more standard, just echoes and, and that sort of thing. Um, it has a lot of range, uh, and I find that it does simple delays uh, pretty pretty well actually um, okay. although it can do a whole lot more than that awesome yeah and I end up using the the Electus Versio firmware for a lot of delay slash reverb type of effects too it's been mm-hmm. a lot of fun because the um, yeah that's that's of course a bit more the well, more distorted approach to it of course yeah Again, I need to I need to make sure that I get a Versio in my system. I need to do that. Um, <laughs> that I can that I can weigh in on these kind of discussions. Um, then we've got Kyle saying X Versio Posido. <laughs> hmm. Oh, we can't fit all that on a panel. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Ah, that is that is quite interesting because then you might uh, you might then say, well, if you've got a Placido, then you might want to consider. Um, hmm. Then you're just blowing it up and and making it twice as twice as big, of course. <laughs> At least. Yeah, that- I mean, a lot of our you know our our focus is really to pack as much functionality into a small space mm-hmm. so that's really been our that's been kind of our goal since the beginning so um, yeah it is it, it's so for us to have a larger module it's you don't see too many of those because we really try to, to have a sweet spot with like the versio's 10 hp mimetic is 10 hp you know or even 4 hp with the the fractio solums and that so it's um yeah, we we try to keep things as compact as we can, mm-hmm. and that is also my my view of, of noise engineering has always been to be very performative, and in a performative approach, you might not always you you want to have well not as many functions packed into one, but you do want to be extremely cognizant of the well of the the. the the footprint any 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 of your functions has, and then of course the overall procedo uh, line is of course well it's it's the well it's 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 the let's say the 
hmm, how do you want to call that? How do I how do I describe that? It's more of the the maker's mark uh, within within the the module where you say, well, if you truly like and if you are in love with module X, then here you have Procedo where you have even more tweakability to it. Um, and then, of course, if you then apply that to the Versio range, well, that that, that ties in then to the, the comment about an, a Versio expander module, whether or that not that might be uh, possible. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Good question, uh, Kyle. Um, then we have Atograph. I agree. I'd love a more standard delay in Versio. Integra is too much, and Electus is more reverb than delay, but sounds great. And well, I think both of you already answered that with the uh, Melodis and the Electus uh, approach that you've uh, yeah. chosen, of course. Um, oh, another. <laughs> How many modules have Basic sold for you by simply being Basic? <laughs> oh yeah, Basic's done some some awesome jams for us uh, back when we would do. Uh, there was a person at Perfect Circuit. He came by and did some really great performances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kyle. Has, yeah, we we okay. even had a uh, a module inspired by him back in the day. Uh, oh, Basicus. Yeah, yeah Variotic Basicus. Yes. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, I need to look that up. <laughs> Where do I find that? That's an older discontinued one at this point. I think that came out in uh, 2015. Hmm. Oh yeah, the Variatic Basicus. Yeah. Nice. That's a beautiful module. It almost has a human aesthetic to it. I like it. Yeah, great. Um, Kyle has another question. Have you ever considered doing a fully curated NE system? Yeah, that's actually something we've been talking about. Uh, quite a bit um, when you make a system you, you really need it to be a full instrument by itself you know um, yeah. when you're building just a, a module it, it's going to fit into a system but if, you, if you're selling a rebuilt thing then it, it needs to be kind of one and done um, so th there's a couple things that are in our product line that um, we just we want to um, Kind of round out some of the edges, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, yeah. We, we definitely want to put out a full any system. And reality is, if you if you look at our social media, um, like Patrick's put together a few cases that are uh, fully noise engineering stuff. I've done some jams with only noise engineering modules. Um, so you know, if, if you need a, a system right now, you can definitely put one together, and it'll be able to do some pretty awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you have systems very specific for a use case, of course. And if you want to have a curated system, you want, as you said, a more rounded approach where you where you might have all of the boxes ticked, of course. Or you might say, well, well, we are we are noise engineering and we do what we want and we just <laughs> do it like that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> But then again, I don't want to be, I don't want to tell you how to do your jobs because of course you're already doing such a great job. Um, then uh, Dan, uh, Annie's 4HP modules killed. The sync iter is the bomb. Unfortunate that it was discontinued. And he adds to that need a stereo mixer added to the lineup. <laughs> hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Affirmative. <laughs> no comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, thanks for that. <laughs> um, so I do. I, I do have to say that the uh, the audience is a bit shy by not uh, coming on stage, but I, I do of course respect that. Um, then I'll, I'll just do a quick uh, roll call and see if we have anyone else who wants to uh, uh, ask the last question. Otherwise, we'll just uh, we'll just wrap up. So I'm going to give everyone a moment to think about what the last question should be. Tan tan tan. Either of you have have heard any good jokes lately? We usually we usually keep them on our Slack channel, and you know, kind of kind of kind kind of feed feed us. You know, we'll kind of vet vet our uh, comedic. You know, uh, geniuses, and see if that we might want to take it on stage at a later time. <laughs> oh, that yeah, would be yeah, fantastic. Those are saved for the uh, 
looks like coffee table book coming out. Ah, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah, that, that's. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably I want to write the uh, the foreword for that. That would be fantastic. Um, so while we're waiting, um, do you guys actually create noise engineering memes yourself? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Nice. There's quite a few that have floated around in the company. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I did one yesterday. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, it's a, oh, yeah. To share those. Patrick's really good at it. Like, we'll, we'll mention something, and Patrick will come in and be like, well, "How did you make that so fast?" It, it's very impressive. <laughs> Patrick has a lot of skills. You know, I give myself three minutes. If it if it's funny enough to where I can build something in like three minutes and Photoshop, I'll do it. Otherwise, I gotta move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, uh, adding adding these co- these kind of constraints, they they do power creativity as well. And we're back to the well the core of today's talk. So that's great. Um, <laughs> so we do have one last comment or question by Dan. Um, which noise engineering module makes the best laser farts? He votes Localic Interitas Pesido. See, that's a very important question. Um, yes. And it's it's something we've all spent a lot of time doing. Um, so yeah, I, w- I would agree the, uh, the LIP is probably the, the winner for, for me there. But honestly, um, if you get Pons Asinorum patched into pretty much anything um, and you, you put it in the cycling mode, it'll... Uh, you're you're well on your way to space for territory. <laughs> <laughs> great. I do you uh, do you concur? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, superb, superb. Um, so it's already twenty minutes past the hour. I do have to apologize, Marcus, Patrick, for going twenty minutes um, over time. I uh, I do have to thank both of you for your for your time, your energy. The stories, the answers, and the and the honesty that we've uh, been able to talk about. I will uh, ask both of you to uh, to come back in the future because I really enjoy talking to you, and I think that there is still a lot of uncovered wisdom uh, with both of you, uh, whether it's about noise engineering, modular in general, or uh, life as a whole. I do want to pick your brains going forward, uh, but for now, I'll uh, have to let you go. Thanks again, and um, yeah. Any any closing comments from from either of you? Any any last words to instill wisdom into the oh, no, audience? Thanks for having us on. This was a uh, a lot of fun. Enjoyed talking to you. Likewise, absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, really nice to be able to get direct feedback from from people that are listening. So thank you to those that are joining joining us on the chat today. And um, yeah, and if there's anything else you need, just let us know. We're easily accessible on social, so we're happy Absolutely. to help. That's great. And I do have to say that that is one of the other defining factors with noise engineering, how approachable you as a company and as human beings are. Um, so that being said, um, for those of you who have joined here live tonight or this afternoon or this morning, Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for uh, being a part of uh, of this. Uh, for those of you listening to the, um, the recording, um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, for taking some of your time and listening to the stories that we are sharing here about Eurorack modular synthesis and life in general. Um, if you do want to join one of these, well, live, feel free to join the uh, Discord channel with the links down below. For now, I would say everyone. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you for the next show. Thanks so much. Cheers.